Welcome uh, to the Sunset Safari on Safari Live. My name is Brent Learsmith. I have VM on camera. And we have Steph out on foot with Brian and Herbert. Now, we're in this area now checking where James had Karula's cubs. Now, we haven't had any sight of them yet. There's a possibility she's come back and collected them. And do another careful check around and then maybe just head a little bit further south, see if we find her tracks as well. Now, there's always a possibility she's made a kill, she's come back, she's fetched them. So we just want to see which way she might have gone. So I think this is where you spotted them from on the Sunrise Safari with James and Vim. They were here. We've had a look on the other side. We didn't see anything, but you must always look very carefully into these thick, thick, thick parts of the bush at this time of the day. It's about 24 degrees Celsius and quite warm. I'm just trying to see if I can see 75 Fahrenheit. See if I can see into the drainage line if they're not just napping there. Let's have a quick look. Now the female was just off on that termite mound over there. We've had a look at that termite mound. She's not there anymore. But leopard cubs, when their moms do leave them behind, they will often scamper about. And they could be sleeping right in the base of this. See anything yet, Vim? Nope. And they could have even moved down towards that gardenia tree. There's another false thorn there. There, there we go. According to them, that's the one he was in this morning. Oh, my four-wheel drive popped out there. <laughs> Interesting stuff. Some time for some. Vehicles sometimes do do that. The four-wheel drive just pops out. There we go. No need for panic. All under control. Now, it is, of course, possible that Queen Karula, the dominant female leopard of Juma, has come during the day collected the kids and taken them off for a meal. Okay, so while we keep checking around here, let's go have a look what Steph's up to on foot. Well, thank you very much, Brent, and good afternoon to all of you on the Sunset Safari here. Where are we on foot again after a, a very, very crazy couple of days around the weekend and uh, this is the first bushwalk I'm doing since Sunday afternoon's landmark event where I ended up squeezing a whole bunch of water from a piece of elephant dung and then drinking it just to show everybody that it won't kill you and I'm still fine and it had no adverse effects on me whatsoever barring a slight aftertaste that I still get every now and again from my beard no, <laughs> I washed that off the second I got home <laughs> so today we've decided that we're going to head off towards Treehouse Dam. We're, we're going in the basically the same area as what, uh, as what Brent is in with Karula. We've got a sneaky suspicion that that male leopard that was seen on the dam wall last night at around about 1 o'clock has also moved into this area. We tracked him here until the end of drive and we've been sort of speculating what, where, how. James said that he saw a tawny eagle in Philemon's dip and with Karula around, she's needing to kill to, to, um, to provide food for those cubs. They're going to be hungry and maybe, just maybe, we can get two leopard and two cubs on a kill. Wouldn't that be something? Now, I've noticed, just as we've come here now, literally in this termite mound that's in front of us over here, that one right there, is a dwarf mongoose clan that has just come inside there. Now, hopefully they'll stick their heads out while we're busy standing here. And what I'm actually hoping for is that this 
is the dwarf mongoose troop or clan. I'm actually not too sure what collective noun Brent is much better at those things than I am business or whatever you want to call it but many of them together this little family will come out and come and show us themselves with us quite close there's a almost semi-habituated clan that's on this particular open area and that's because they come and raid the dustbins in the kitchens at Vuyatela Lodge and they sort of lost their fear for people I know that I can get within one meter within one yard basically of, uh, of these little guys they don't look like they're coming out to play today. The wind might be making them a little bit nervous. And I've seen two tawny eagles flying around already this afternoon. They were flying around in that patch of sky there behind us. And it might be because they, they, they generally carry an eaters, but it, they may also want to come and take these little dwarf mongoose. And I'm just, I'm thinking in mind, they don't want to come out and play now. But we'll stand here for another minute or so. Let us just see if they come out. The wind is in our favor. The wind is blowing straight into our faces. I am speaking a little bit loud, but that shouldn't do too much to deter them at all. We have a forktail drongo sitting on a branch just over there between the big standing tree and this fallen down tree there. We've got a red-billed buffalo weaver on the floor collecting sticks. But what is most significant is the forktail drongo, the blackbird that's sitting on the branch. That is the more significant. Forktail drongos quite often feed in association with mongoose and the reason for that is because as the mongoose are feeding they also kick up insects that fly away from them and the drongo is quick to snatch up a fleeing grasshopper or a dragonfly or whatever comes out of the grass to uh, and that tells me that these mongoose are still there actually which is quite nice I think what we do let's get a little bit closer and see how close that drongo will actually let us get obviously how hungry it is will determine this particular thing we should be able to get quite close if I say so myself the mongoose are all in here they don't want to come out and play at the moment they have gone down deep into there you can have a look that's little bits and pieces of their dung where they come and basically sun themselves in the morning and you can come and have a look down here this one's got no spider webs in so this is the hole that they come in and out of I see all that that was quite nice inside there hey now deep down inside there will be nice and warm the termite mounds they actually generate a lot of their own metabolic heat and so it'll be quite warm inside there and the termites will keep it nice and cozy obviously they'll eat whatever termites come into the chamber if they can and the termites realizing this would fortify those chambers and leave the mongoose alone now that drongo i see has flown away that gives us an opportunity then to move on we don't waste too much more time with this afternoon's walk. Let's just go. Alright. Let's just take one last look over here and see. Ah, there we go. Have a look. There these little dwarf mongoose are. Just on the lip. We obviously split this clan in two. There they're coming out there. So we've obviously got just a few of the members in that hole that you were looking at there. And now we've got these dwarfies. Let me see if I can get a little bit closer. What we're going to try and do is stay downwind of them, which means that I need to stay on this side. And what I'm going to aim to try and do is sit on the termite mound. looks like these I'm not going to face him so I'm going to turn my back to him so that he doesn't see my front I don't want them to see my front I don't want it to look like I'm hunting and then I'm going to sit down and I'm going to act as if I'm not taking any notice of them now these are the smallest one of the they say the smallest mammalian carnivores in Africa but to be quite honest with you they are carnivora they're part of the carnivora family but the smallest carnivores in Africa have to be for me the shrews not part of the same family it just depends on which book you read but roughly about a hundred times smaller than the largest African carnivore the African lion the male lion these guys weigh in a region of about a hundred grams now what that is in uh, I'm actually not quite sure of the, 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 the conversion there. 
I'll have to wait for Kirsty to whisper it into my ear. All right, now that sentry that you're looking at over there, that is to look for any danger. It's not like it's a sacrificial mongoose or anything like that. It's just in every mongoose clan, there will be one mongoose that is, that is a little bit more alert to dangers than all of the others. And while that mongoose takes point, it's usually one of the adults. While that mongoose takes point, the rest of the mongoose are, are underneath the ground waiting to see if the all clear is sounded. And they've got a proper language. They've got a language that can, that can tell the difference between a snake or an eagle, between a leopard or a honey badger. They can literally tell what predator is what, and with a quick, quick signal, they then can either move into higher ground, move underground, or scatter, depending on what predator is hunting them. Don't they just have the most delightful faces you've ever seen? I know we see them quite a lot on the drives out here. They're actually quite a lot of little mongoose clan at Juma. But I must be honest with you, they have to be one of my favorites. <laughs> oh, that's very, very cute. They would be foraging on this open area for what? I have absolutely no idea. I know that from time to time there's been a few locusts on quarantine lately, but there is just zero grass for them, for any sort of other insects to be supported and unless they're digging out scorpions and spiders and the odd beetle that might fly onto quarantine here by mistake i don't think that the pickings are very generous out here must be honest these things have some of the best attitudes i've ever seen i think if they were as big as an african male lion humans would absolutely be on the menu for the little guys but on that note, I'm going to send you over to Brent. He's got an update for you. We had no luck with those cubs, so now we've come to the southern boundary to see if she's taken them out. And we have spotted some tracks, but we think they're a little bit older. On the, on the left. There we go. Let's have a look. Ah, well spotted there. Need leopard cub tracks, but I think they are a little bit older. Although, with the wind we've had today, I'm just going to move quickly so you can see them. Here we are, little leopard tracks. But with the wind we've had today and how busy this road is, I wonder. But VM seems to think he remembers seeing them there this morning, so we're going to keep going. Hi, William. Uh, William's another new viewer. Great to have you on board, William. William says, how have I not watched this before? It's so great. We agree, William. We should keep watching. And we are looking at, for Karula, our dominant female leopard, and her two cubs at the moment. Oh, yeah. Those cub tracks are not, and those two are a bit more fresh, I'm afraid. Oh, dear. Well, we'll move along then. Uh, she never know with Karula, she might come back, but there's only, I only see one cub track there. But they do tend to scuttle about. And I say this road is very busy. And there's so many of her tracks up and down here. Hi, Debbie. Debbie's in Vancouver. Now, oh, Debbie, I apologize that my neck is craning off the side, but I'm just trying to make sure we don't miss any tracks. Debbie's wondering, is it possible that Karula would share a kill with any of the males? I think she would possibly uh, with, with, with Tingana. Uh, whether she would take the cubs there or not, mm, difficult one to call. Maybe when they're a bit older. So we're going to keep checking 
There we go. Uh, it was very fresh, unfortunately, especially with the amount of wind we've had today and how busy this road is. Very, very clear tracks of Karula and the Cubs. Here's the clear one, the clearest one over there. So there she is, that's one of the little ones. Right on the edge of the road, still quite nice and clear, so it looks like she has moved those cubs out. Well, isn't it lucky we have another leopard in the bag on the other, on Arethusa? But we're going to go see if we can find some Ellies and other stuff, and then we'll probably try and make our way towards Tingana, as, I mean, not Tingana, and Vula, a little later on the safari. Let's see, you can, they almost look so fresh, we might spot her disappearing into the distance. Nope. She's come back, she's walking parallel. Ooh, you never know. They turn off there. Looks like it. Oh dear. Hi, William. <laughs> William says, what? Did they interact with us too? This is officially the coolest thing ever. Well, we agree with you wholeheartedly, William. Now, if you're so new and you want to know how to interact with us, you can do it by two means. Use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can use the email address questions at wildearth.tv. So it looks like Queen Krula and the Cubs have crossed south. So we're going to leave the area. I did see some elephants on my way out to go look for it. So I think I'm going to head towards those ellies. Now, of course, there were male leopard tracks on Juma this morning as well. We're pretty sure it was Tingana since Mbula's on a kill in Arethusa and they went into the block. I know Steph wants to go have a look around that area. And then also, uh, it looks like young Sindelai, or Sindile, young male leopard, has also made a kill, but unfortunately in Buffel's hook. And it's just, just beyond where we can go. So we we'll make my way back to where, where I last saw those elephants. Let's go see what Steph's up to on foot. Welcome back to the bushwalk. As you can see, we're just busy marching from one place to another. We're going to try and get to the entrance of the old Ahina Den off of Philemon's Dip, where we can see what tracks we are finding over here. But while we're going about, we just might as well chat. It's a long time since I've particularly talked about the drought. I know Brent and I share a common sort of feeling around how we feel about droughts. Me personally, I feel that droughts are about as necessary as what floods are and as what fires are. And although it's actually not nice to see animals deteriorate and they, they, um, they deteriorate in condition and the bush looks terrible. And it really is the only way that the bush thins out. A lot of species of... of plants will die back and create open areas which in turn in the wet in the wet season then creates grassland which of course is very very good for animals and of course then there's also the animals that look shocking and a lot of animals die it's not uncommon in bad droughts like we've had for up to 10 percent of the animals in a particular area to die off starting with all your large herbivores and the warthog in particular are quite drought sensitive Oh, here's some fresh elephant tracks. Looks like a young Ellie. And this is not too, you see the size difference between my foot and that elephant track. These are not too old. We've got quite a stiff breeze blowing at the moment. And what I'm going to show you now is how quickly in a stiff breeze like we've got, footprints like this become old. 
what I'm going to do is blow on them. Not harder than what the wind is blowing around here. Have a look at how old that one becomes, and we'll move across to this one here. And you can see the difference. Have a look at how sharp those still are. So this is actually quite fresh. It's a female elephant, just judging by the size. Could also be a young male elephant, but the presence of other elephant tracks here will tell me whether or not it's a herd of Ellies that we're looking out for, or whether it's a young bull. Now young bulls of this size generally do hang around at the back of herds and also are, are starting to go out and become further and further separated from their natal herd. But my feeling is that this is a female and that this is probably a good time to start keeping my eyeballs peeled for any elephant that, that may or may not be in the area. Ah, Betty, all the way from Texas. Hello, Betty, how are you? Good morning to you. you sun must be rising there or pretty close to it. Um, you wanted to know what is to become of the jar I found in that termite mound. You know, Betty, that was probably the find of the day for me. It's actually the find, probably a find, of, of course, in terms of finding something in the bush. Probably the best find I've ever done in my guiding career is finding one of these pots I keep on telling people about but never really know anything about and in the interim I've actually found out some more information about these pots in this area at the time um, and with Herbert's help I thought that the pot was a bank of some sort it's where someone would put their treasures and would place it in the termite mound would place it in the termite mound and then let the termites grow over it because they disturbed it there and only he knows where his treasures are and when he needs some treasures he goes and digs it out and he has it now that's one one use Confirmed by Herbert, who's a local Shangan gentleman. Um, one of the other uses could be, it's, it's, it's in this particular area where families that have got a lineage, a long lineage in this area, give, um, how do I say? Sorry, I just heard some elephants making a noise. Not uh, give thanks, it's almost like give thanks to their ancestors, but it's a little bit more than that. I'm busy trying to think of the word now in my mind. But basically what they do is they'd walk around to prominent termite mounds and make an offering of beer in a clay pot that they bury inside a termite mound. And it could be anywhere from a couple of hundred years, well, a couple of years, a couple of dozen years, to a couple of hundred years ago. So quite difficult to actually ascertain exactly when that pot was put into that termite mound. I mean, it was probably about that deep into the termite mound, and it wasn't in the center of the termite mound, it was just off center by about halfway to the edge of the termite mound and um, even the landowner here says he doesn't actually know when it was he actually wants me to take him out there uh, but later on this week so I'll be hosting another walk out to that particular termite mound with that pot in and we will be doing uh, with the landowner and he will be having a look at the pot and giving his input um, the landowner here Mr. Yuri Mulman has got extensive knowledge of the local people it's something that he's taken quite seriously since a little boy and he'd be able to tell me a little bit more and then we'd be able to share a bit more with you about exactly what the thoughts are around this particular pot. And we're lucky, at Juma um, is employed a large portion of the family that has been living on this particular land and has, has lineage on this particular land. Um, I don't know for how long back, that would be a, 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 a statement that I'd have to make after consulting with the family themselves. But yeah. That is basically what I have to say about that. So we're going to go out there again. We're going to have a look. We're going to get some more information from the people that have lived on this piece of land and from the landowner who's a student of history. And then I'll be able to tell you a bit more about that. But in the meantime, I think Brent has found something large for you to have a look at. Well, in Africa, we've got lots of large skies. So there we go, a nice big African sky for you. I'm only joking. That's not what we found. And we've got a young elephant bull next to us. He's just in the thicket, so we're going to move slightly forward. There he is. Feeding off an acacia gerardi, 
or a red thorn. Now I can hear a few more other elephants about, but they seem to be all in the thickets. I'm hoping he's going to move out towards us shortly. There we go. Hello, mister. Young wall. Or is it? No, it looked like a young wall through the bush, but it's not. It's actually a big female. Hello, madam. I wonder where the rest of the breeding herd are. And it might be hiding in the little river system we're next to. Let's move forward again a little bit. Oh, here comes a little one. I'm going to go back instead. Say when, Vim? Hello, little one. Sniffing out something in the bottom of that quarry bush. What are you after? Oh, and another one. So it does look like the rest of the breeding herd are in these riverine thickets. And hopefully they're all going to pop out around us shortly. These little guys are probably just over a year. Depending on how they're using their trunks and their size. Maybe even close to two. Hello you. They will still be drinking mother's milk, but they are weaned. I'm just going to go forward a little bit. Hello. Hello, Trouble. Did you trumpet at me? It looks like both of them are young boys. Just they are him sniffing out the tiniest little morsel with his trunk. Now, these elephants, these little ones are probably 10 foot from us, maybe a bit further, 12 foot. It's not uncommon to have them come right up to us in the vehicles. Hey, mister. Hello, Jeet. Jeet's wondering how sensitive to, sp to smell little elephants are. Very. And um, elephants probably have one of the best senses of smell out here in the bush. And they use that nose to find lots of delicious things to eat. I'm not entirely sure how far an elephant can smell for. They can hear for nearly 20 kilometers. And they communicate in low rumbles. A lot of them inaudible to us, and just too low. Are we coming to be investigated, I think? Hello. Hello, naughty. <laughs> Little elephant bulls are so much fun. I'm pretty sure this is mom to one of them. Across the 
the road just behind us. Hello, Gracie. Uh, Gracie is eight years old and a firm Safari Live regular. Nice to have you on, us, on with us this evening, Gracie. Now, Gracie wants to know, uh, do thorns ever get stuck in their throats? Or do they get stuck in their tummy? And that answer to that is not, Gracie. Now, their mouth is so tough like an old shoe, and their big teeth crush up those thorns. So once they swallow them, they're really little bits. I'm just going to turn the car around. What are you doing? Are you trying to sneak up on me? <laughs> He's right here. <laughs> Hello, little boy. <laughs> oh, they are so much fun, little elephants. Now, that's just playfulness. Oh, he's, look, he's, he's literally nearly touching the car now. There you go. Liam's going to swing around for you. Hello, little naughty. What do you think you're doing? Yes. That's it. Behave yourself. Now, you might do that again as I start the car. No. Okay. Isn't that absolutely wonderful? Cat. And Cat's also a regular who's in Tampa. Cat says watching elephants is such great theory. A therapy. Could watch them all day. Me too. They're always up to something in these breeding herds. Oh, <laughs> he tripped. He's looking a bit sheepish. Elephants are, of course, incredibly large animals. And if they wanted to, they could do us some grievous bodily harm. But they generally don't. Uh, Lael in Washington is wondering what sort of age do, would they be able to really do some damage uh, to the vehicles. So probably anything from 10 upwards, uh, they're really big enough to, to whack a car. Sounds like there's some more a little bit further behind. I'm just going to reverse again. See what those ones back there are up to. Oh, it's just another female. Another big female down there. And look at lovely long tusks. Hi, Roger. Uh, Roger's also in Tampa. R Roger says. Well, he knows I know what I'm doing, but what makes me confident that the elephants won't charge us? Um, Roger, I'm reading their body language, and their body language gives away a lot of things, and they are very, very relaxed at the moment. And most animals don't actually want to get into a physical confrontation with something else, even with another animal, because they might get injured. So that's that's why, Roger. I watch their body language very, very carefully. I've been spend I've been I've spent a lot of time with elephants since I was very young. So fortunately, I've got their body language down quite well. And at the moment, these are very, very relaxed. And we're gonna move on now. We're gonna leave the eddies to their do their thing. We're going to carry on, see what else we can find. Okay. 
I've just got to be on the Game Drive radio for a second uh, while I yabber on. Let's go see what Steph's up to. Welcome back, everyone. If you've just joined, I'm Steph. You're on the bushwalk portion of the Sunset Safari, and we found a nest here. You got me in the act of trying to figure out what made this nest, what's in this nest, and is it still in use? Now, that is a very, very good question. I can't tell you what made the nest, but I can tell you if it's still in use by climbing into it. Now, climbing trees isn't one of my fortes so much as it is Mr. Hendry's. Yeah, or Brent Leo's. <laughs> I'll probably climb about as good as Brent does, actually, which is not at all. Got something there. So it has no eggs in. But it does look like there are some remnants of eggs in there. <laughs> Almost did an exact Brent. Now I tell you, finding out what is inside these nests for your entertainment is not funny. And what I can tell you is something very, very weird. This is what's inside. A whole bunch of millipede circles. Segments, really. So whatever was in here, last, ate a millipede for some reason. And there's not just one, there's many. There's an entire millipede in front. That is something so bizarre. I wouldn't have the first clue at which bird eats millipedes, to be quite honest with you. Let me see if I can lift this nest out. I'll show you. Birds very often do not use discarded nests like this. Not small ones like this, anyway. Have a look inside there. Isn't that incredible? Never seen anything like that in my entire life. Pretty weird, eh? I'll just put it back there. If any of you have any ideas as to what bird that may or may not have been, please feel free to share it with me. You can send emails to questions at wildearth.tv or use the Twitter handle hashtag Safari Live, however Twitter works. And, uh, and I'll share it with everybody else. All right, now let me try and get out of here gracefully so that I don't embarrass myself further here we go should have used that route the first time all right come along now we are tracking a male leopard through here um, we don't quite know we heard from we heard from a feedback this morning i heard secondhand that it was potentially a mvula that was at the dam wall last night and Mvula was found this morning by Brent all the way on Arethusa on a half-finished water kill. And so we're beginning to think that it might be a different male leopard. Might be Tingana, could be a different male. Might have been Mvula that then walked across to Arethusa and stole a kill from some Ahina or another leopard. We don't really know. It's a puzzle that is yet undiscovered. And um, we'll carry on with, the, with unraveling as much as we can. The trail is a bit old, it's a bit cold, and the wind has definitely made it much harder to actually decipher that trail right now. But luckily for us, we have an Herbeth, which is, which is a tracker, definitely a much better tracker than I am. Here's an interesting bit of feedback. So Paul and Annie both think that the nest could have been from Drongos. Paul and Annie, yeah, I don't know. I don't know anything except for a civet and some scorpions that eat millipedes. And I don't know of any birds that would want to eat millipedes. And I don't, I've never seen a Drongo with a millipede busy hitting a millipede to death. I'm not saying it's not feasible at all. I just have never seen a Drongo eating millipedes. If you wouldn't mind sharing the source of that information as well as why you think that is, um, for me, I'm still at a loss, to be quite honest. We're coming up here. One of my favorite things is to lift up these logs, and this, to me, looks like a nice log to lift. 
It's been here for a long time. Ooh. <laughs> it's obviously quite a solid, quite a solid bit of tree trunk. Kirsty telling me that I didn't gem enough today or eat enough of my spinach. No, nothing too much underneath here. Yeah? What I like doing then is just putting the log back where you found it, just in case, you know. I wouldn't want somebody to lift the roof off of my home, stare at me with a big glass lens and then leave without putting the roof back again. That's for sure. Now, we always wondered where civets and honey badgers live. This is a perfect place for them to do that. There's this massive old stump with a cavity on the inside. And you can just have a look inside there, how well that would protect anything really from the elements. It does look like a squirrel's been using this one as a pantry. Have a look at these discarded marula pips. That's the only thing that does that. Now, I think I need to first aid my leg here, which means I'm just going to take the half of the tree that's stuck in my shin out. And while I do that, Brent's got an update on what it is following up on trees. You have caught me trying to button my shirt while driving. It's not as, as easy as one would think. Uh, I'm going to start slowly making my way towards Arathusa. I'm going to get an update there on what's happening with Mvula. For those of you who knew, Mvula is a, a big male leopard. He used to be dominant over this area, but uh, he's towards the end of his career. He's sort of retired. Now, it's not a nice, re nice retirement job. Uh, or not job, a nice retirement like going down to sunny Florida. Uh, here it means he's got to duck and dive and try avoid all the other male leopards uh, who are younger than him because uh, he's not quite in the form he used to be. So he used to actually be dominant over the whole of Juma uh, and most of Cheetah Plains and, and Torchwood. Now it is now Tingana's realm. I don't know those leopard tracks that we had down near that old hyena den that Steph wants to go follow. Uh, we think that's probably is that's probably him. Oh, I nearly got it. Okay, I'm just there. We go. Ha ha! Success. Hi, Jen. Jen's in Minnesota. Now, there's somewhere that gets truly cold. Now, Jen's wondering, have Shadow and her cub been seen since we saw them with Sindile hanging about? Uh, now, just for those of you who might not know, Sindile is Shadow's last cub, and he had a very rough start uh, to his young life. He, he caught a domestic dog that tested positive for uh, rabies. So he went into quarantine and he had to get a bunch of injections and uh, live in, in captivity for a little while. He was re-released about a month ago, just over a month ago. And he came back looking for his mom. But in the, while he's been gone, in the seven months he's been gone, his mom has had another set of cubs. She had two, one has been lost, uh, but she still has one, a little female. So Jen's wondering, has she been seen? Is, they have, but outside our Travis area, I know they were seen the next day, and they've been seen a few times. I think she might stay clear of this area for a while, uh, while Cindile is still about. Where Mvula has his kill is right sort of on the boundary between the Anderson male and Tingana's territories. So I'm sure he's hoping he manages to eat that whole warthog before the other males come on patrol. Oh, 
a little diker. Oh, one, two, three, and run away. Oh, it didn't run too far this time. There we go. A little grey diker. So that's an adult male. Yep, off he goes. Now, oh, they don't hang around too much before they disappear, the little species. Okay, so we're going to cross into Arethusa up here shortly, and uh, hopefully Mbulla will still be on that warthog kill. He was lying in the most precarious position this morning. He just couldn't seem to get comfortable. on the blower and you will see me talk on this from time to time and what I'm doing is I'm communicating with all the other game drives from the other safari lodges that are around so we keep in contact find out where animals are moving what's around and, and it makes sure that we all have the best safari possible Afternoon stations in the west, so Brent crossing, and I have an update on Mvula, please. Oh, I'm just trying to listen to the radio, let me get a bit higher, I think. Sorry, last station you broke up quite badly. So I'm just trying to listen here. Oh, I'm not hearing them. I'm going to wait till I'm a bit closer and I'll try again. Oh, I can hear Roy. Let's try Roy. Thanks, Roy. Um, Roy, how many stations following up? Copy. I'll go check around that area. Right. Okay, so it sounds like the meat is still in the tree, but he's not. So we're going to go have a look. He could be sleeping close by. He could have gone to Red Dam for a drink. I think maybe we'll start our search at the water and then move our way back down towards his last position. So on the subject of lep leopards, James Richard would like to know has Tundi been seen around? Uh, he's really curious whether she was looking for a den site or just was lying in that big Timburti tree where she had a kill. Uh, I haven't heard of her being seen since then, so I, I can't say with any definite facts for you there, James. But uh, hopefully we will see her again soon. Hi, 
it's Cecilia in Maryland. Welcome on drive, Cecilia. Cecilia would like to know how the Kruger Park got its name. Uh, it's named after one of the first presidents, uh, Paul Kruger. And he was a great lover of the Bushveld. And I think the people who formed it decided to name it after him. He was often referred to as Oom Paul, uh, Uncle Paul. Oom is often cards for Uncle. Well, we're going to go check around Red Dam. Maybe in has gone there for a drink. Uh, and then, other than that, we'll move our way down the Marikani River, see if we can find him. While we do that, it sounds like Steph has patched himself up and is ready to see. Oh, blah, blah, blah. Are you ready to go see what he's up to? I have patched myself up, and we're back hot on the trail of this male leopard right here. Have a look this huge big track, this beautiful juicy track as I like to call them. They're not quite shining. When it's shining it means that it has still some surface tension from the moisture in the air. But this is that male leopard track and this is direction, this way, heading directly towards Arethusa. So it's becoming more and more plausible that Mvula managed to do a massive loop from Juma and from Juma Dam all the way into Arethusa and probably stole the kill. That is with my hypothesis is at the moment probably stole a water kill from another leopard there which would account for the time difference between one o'clock this morning when he was seen at Juma and him walking all the way all the way to Arethusa which is probably about ooh, a good just less than 10 miles from here to catch a warthog and finish half of it before breakfast this morning it's a little bit too much but him walking here you can see have a look at the size here a friend tracker of mine Rich in Dubai and always said a full grown male leopard track has a, has a track about as big as a fist. And you can see there that that track fits exactly into my fist. Almost from toes to the back of the pad. Here's the back of the pad here. I'll put a white stick on it. And here's the front of the pad here. And you can see there muscles between there. He's been walking on a game path. Now it's not uncommon for large male leopards to walk and to use termite mounds like this as a vantage point. And we're going to prove the point right now. It looks like a nice, easy, easy enough one to climb. But basically, male leopards, you can see the bush around here. All at eye, le all at eye level is all the same uniform bush. We're looking into it. And it doesn't really change when you come down. When you come down to about leopard level, it's the same. You're looking into the brush. Now, although their senses are very, very, very good, much better than mine is, for instance, quite often large male leopard are not scared and will walk up the side of a termite. We're going to try and do it from his level. You're at almost exactly the level of a leopard. And he would have come up here, paused briefly on the top to make sure that he wasn't going to get himself into trouble. And then he would have surveyed his kingdom and have a look at the difference that this makes. Obviously it doesn't give you a view into tomorrow, but it still is a lovely view of the bush. 365 degrees almost. It's also in my opinion where large male leopard learn how to hunt warthog is because Termite mounds like the one we're standing on at the moment quite often house warthogs. And one of the favorite things that large male leopard like to do is to hunt warthog. Warthog generally, or large male warthog at least, are generally out of the weight category of most leopard. But for big male leopards, they wait at the entrance of the burrows as the pigs come out in the morning, jump off the burrows and, and, and catch them, turning them over. Their necks are too thick to get a proper bite on a large male warthog. What they normally do is they bite that warthog on the chest and canines and bite force bite into the heart of that warthog, killing it almost instantly. 
It's the most unbelievable thing to see. I've been lucky to witness it one or two times in my career. And from here, you can actually see that there's a burrow of some sort here. Wow. Always ponder, did this leopard not come here and wait for this particular thing? Now, the trick here would obviously be for me not to get warthogged. I don't possess the canines or the claws or the strength of a leopard. And so I'm generally quite nervous around burrows like this. <laughs> when you come down, I'll show you evidence why this is probably a warthog. It's gonna take you a bit of time to dismount. You don't have to go that way. You can go this way down. It's probably a little bit easier. <laughs> And it might be that this large male leopard came and visited this warthog burrow. Have a look at the evidence that this is a warthog burrow. Warthog love mud. Other hole dwelling animals do not love mud. Porcupine do not love mud. Civet do not love mud. Hyenas do, but not as much as warthog. And have a look, this is a a warthog that's gone in and used his own burrow as a scratching point. I wonder if that's not why this male leopard has come here. Isn't it a beautiful story? Right, and then he's come down off of this termite mound and carried on. Hunting, marking out his territory, maybe roaring. Myself and Kirsty heard him roaring this morning. He actually roared us awake this morning. I don't quite know what time it was. It felt like it was in my dream. So... Couldn't have been too early. Ah. So Susan and Maggie M have just given me some feedback to say that um, red wing starlings, I just want to help Brian here with a cable. Over. There we go. That red-winged starlings are quite known to eat millipedes. And you know, that actually gives me an idea. If red-winged starlings can eat millipedes, they don't really occur here. The closer you get to the escarpment, you get the red-winged starlings. But a very close cousin to the red-winged starlings, the Birchall's glossy starling. The Birchall's glossy starling is also a large insectivorous starling. And I'm wondering if the lack of insects this year because of the drought hasn't led to the glossy starling, the Birchall starling, start feeding on millipedes. That's an hypothesis. It's a hypothesis. And I think I'm going to stick with that for now. That the drought has caused the drop in insect numbers, which has caused the Birchall starling to have the millipedes on its menu. And what we're looking at there is a mother Birchall starling bringing millipedes to its babies and the discarded shell of the millipede on the nest. Nice one. Thank you very, very much. We'll see if we can disprove that hypothesis, either through conversation in the medium we're doing now, or whether or not I can find some alternative information for you in any of my books I have in my, in my room. I've just been signaled to Brian that we're walking directly into the sun, which is ruining his shot. And I'm to change direction, which I will do duly. Right, and with it getting a bit thick in here, and me needing to concentrate on our surroundings to get us out of here without being headbutted by a buffalo, Brent has just got to Arethusa, and I'm sure he's dying to tell you what updates are there for you. I'm just trying to listen to the game drive radio at the moment. Can't quite hear what's going on. We're right in the lowest point of the property, going down this little riverbed. We're not far from where that leopard was, so I'm just checking very, very carefully around here. He could be sleeping under any bush. Always pays to just stop and listen every now and then. You might hear an alarm call. That leopard might have been spotted by something.
And the tree BM is showing you is called a russet bush willow. Now it gets its name from the seeds. I'm just going to grab one. There we go. And you can see why it gets the name of the russet bush willow. The seeds look like they've actually rusted, so that reddish colour that's on them. Quite important when it comes to drought uh, for certain tribes, especially up in further north in Africa. The seeds are used as cattle fodder for their livestock. So for goats, cows, sheep are fed those seeds. You can also make a coffee substitute out of the seeds. And they also make quite pretty decorations. The russet bush willow. Sorry, I just need to listen to this the game drive here. I'm trying to figure out if they found Willow yet. Sorry guys, the radio is a bit bad here. Roy, sorry, I missed that update. Copy, confirm I can make my way straight in. Sorry about this. Oh, sorry, I just can't hear. Great news, and Vula has been found very close to where he was lying with that meat. Uh, I'm sorry, just the radios here were a bit bad. Oh, war dog! So, that war dog is a live one. Where we're going to, there's not so much of a live one and he's been caught by a leopard. Now, just above that warthog is a, a bush willow tree that looks like it's changing colors. So Aaron in Louisiana is wondering, are we currently in fall? Now, no, we don't really have a true fall like you guys do. We really only have two seasons. We have a wet season and a dry season, and we're in the dry season, so certain of the trees will change, and they change at different times of the year depending on how much uh, rain we've had. But now we're getting close to where that leopard was this morning. Now this is an ideal leopard country around these little river systems. Lots of wonderful trees for them to stash their kills in. Okay, let me just have a time for my afternoon meeting. Hello, everyone. Hello, sir. Alrighty, so back to us. Looks like Brent had a gremlin creep into his signal over there. Not uncommon, as you would know if you watched this morning's, uh, this morning's live drive. And I am heading towards that tree there with the red blaze on it because I want to see why is it red. I know it's a marula, and I know that marula bark is so red, but I want to know why that one is so red. It's abnormally red. And I want to see what exactly is it that caused that particular wound on the tree 
It's most likely elephant. What I'm speculating at the moment is that a buffalo has rubbed itself up and down on that bark, thereby increasing the wound size. And letting that very diagnostic red sap come out of the tree. Let's go and have a look here. So the first thing I'm noticing around the tree is some red shaving. Just having a look around so I don't get elephanted by the elephant that caused the wound. <laughs> Have a look at this. So now the puzzle starts. Excuse me, going quiet. There's a lot of the the leftover memory and brain capacity I had was given to try to decipher this. There's quite evidently horn marks here, horn or tusk marks here, and then this rubbing. Now, this is not, definitely hasn't been stripped off the way that an elephant strips off a piece of bark. This has definitely been rubbed this way. And I think what's happened here is that a buffalo bull has had a serious itch and decided that this marula tree was the absolute best thing for him to get that itch settled. And what he would have done is he would have horned this marula tree, if you can imagine these huge horns and he would have come in and he would have tried to horn this tree by getting either at an at, at some mites and whatever he had on his muzzle or he had it on the back of his horn and he would have gone up and down like this to try and get those big horns of his behind the tree and scratching this as much as what he could and that's the, the that hard crenellated boss that you would have seen on a lot of the buffalo around here would have done this. And on that note, Brent has found what he's been looking for. Enjoy. And we were looking for a jackalberry tree. Look at that magnificent tree, but even more magnificent is the male leopard who's sitting on top of that termite mound. There we go, that is Mvula. It means the rain. You can see he's got a nice full belly full of warthog and you can see he's quite old if we look at his ears you see how tattered they are they've been bitten by many many flies over the years you can see how he flicks them now that's to keep the little stable flies the biting flies off hello big boy so it's quite a tough life for this leopard now he's got to sort of sneak around and try avoid the dominant males in Tingana and Anderson and he, end up, he ends up covering quite a lot of distance Oof. but at the moment life is all good you can see the flies are severely irritating him Hi, Matt. Matt's in the Lone Star State, Texas. Matt says he's been out of the loop for a little while and has heard us all say that Tingana is now the dominant male leopard on, on Juma, and that is true. Now, Matt would like to know how this came to be. Did Tingana push Mvula out, uh, or did something else happen? No, Tingana chased him, and chased him quite heavily over a, a, an extended period until eventually he decided he couldn't maintain that territory anymore and he sort of moved down to the Cheetah Plains area where we hang around there but now Shivambalan, another male leopard, is putting pressure on him there. So he's become a nomadic male and he pops up everywhere. Um, he's been all the way down to Sand River, um, he's popped up on various spots on Juma, Cheetah Plains, Arethusa, Sibambili, 
Literally, you never know where he might pop up next. And as you can see, he's a nice flat cat atop the termite mound. And now if we come out and up the weeping boar bean tree, we will see very, very well hidden there. And he's eaten quite a lot since we were there this morning. But there, just off to the left, you can see the snout of a warthog. Young warthog, I'd say probably one of maybe last year's babies, not quite this year's babies, but a, a young warthog. And he has eaten most of it already. Now, there actually are some warthog burrows on this termite mound. We can't see them from where we are, but I think he caught it maybe last night as it was coming in to the termite mound in the early evening. Maybe during the day yesterday. Hi, Rachel. Rachel would like to know whether old male leopards normally die of natural causes uh, or from other male leopards. Well, in the bush, it's very, very seldom that anything dies from old age, and, which would be the natural causes. They're normally killed by, if not a predator of the same species, a predator of another species. Get a bit old, get a bit diff, get a bit slow, get caught by hyenas, get caught by lions. And so very seldom, it, or almost never in terms of big cats, that they will die of old age. Hi, Alice. Alice is in Ohio. Alice would like to know, do old leopards lose their teeth like old people? Alice, it's very seldom that leopards actually make it to an age uh, where they lose teeth regularly. You probably find he will lose some of his teeth. They might break as he gets older, but he's, or they more get worn than lost. Uh, oh, does that a biting fly got you there? Oh. He's still a very pretty leopard, well, apart from his tatty ears, but he's very photogenic, Mr. Mbula. And if you heard that click, that was just me snapping a picture. And I encourage you guys to do the same with screenshots and, and share them on our Facebook page, or you put them, which is Safari Live, or pop them on Twitter with the hashtag Safari Live. Uh, the hyenas haven't found him yet. Now, he's what we would call a nomadic male now, and Robin in Maryland's wondering if he still marks his territory. He won't. He, he'll be very quiet. He won't, he won't scent mark too openly. He won't scrape. He won't roar. Uh, he'll try to keep under the, under the radar, Robin. said he's still a very pretty boy. Oh, that's an ear flicking. And flop again. Oh, it's quite nice to just sit, listen. I can 
yeah, I think what sounds like a white-throated robin chat in the trees not too far. Got some Cape turtle doves. And while we sit quietly with this male leopard, hopefully one of these incredible bird species will pop into view. But while we play the patience game, hoping he's going to climb the tree to go feed on the rest of that warthog, let's go see what Steph's up to. How lucky are you to be sitting with Mvula and that half a warthog now this afternoon? Quite nice, what a treat. We're still on the tracks of this male leopard just because we just want to confirm exactly what's happening here. And it's getting, it's getting fresher obviously as it's getting closer to Arethusa which is leading us to believe that this is exactly what has happened. Mvula, having left Juma last night, walked all the way across to Arethusa and stealing a warthog kill from another leopard or a hyena, for that matter of fact. Big male leopard, it's not uncommon for them to steal kills from almost anything. Except lions, of course, they won't risk that. And clans of a hyena. Right, we've changed our direction a little bit. Not only because it's becoming clear that Mvula is the, the owner of these tracks, but also because we are going to need to start making our way back towards Sorry, I just heard a sound there that sounded quite elephant-like. But it's because I'm standing in this thicket with this variable bush willow. And they've got the most unbelievable dried leaves. They turn an, into an almost leather-like... Trying to find a soft one here. But they turn into an almost leather-like leaf. And when they rub together, they sound like elephant ears rubbing in the bush. And I'll see if I can get my microphone close by. Listen to this. That, when you hear that in the bush, is a sound. It sounds like an elephant walking through a bush and then his ears making that noise. And it's quite disconcerting, I must be honest with you. It gets your, it gets your, 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 your attention, put it to you that way. All right, let's head back here. Good afternoon, Amy. And you've just asked me if we have any owls in our area. We actually do have some owls, and I'm going to try and name them for you. Starting at the biggest, we've got the Varose Eagle Owl. Then we've got the Spotted Eagle Owl. Then we have a Barn Owl and a Wood Owl. Then we have a Pals Fishing Owl, which is one of the bigger ones. I just missed that one out. And then we've got the smaller owlets. Oh, we've also got Grass Owl. Then we've got the smaller owlets. We've got the Pearl Spotted Owl, the Barred Owl and the Scops Owl, and the White-Faced Owl. So there we go. Nine owls for you to choose from. We have them all occurring over here. The rarest to see would probably be the Pals Fishing Owl, um, which has been recorded on the Sand River and on the Sabi River, but we don't get them right here. They require these large expanses of pretty deep still water. Um, and I think White-Faced Owl, although we hear them from time to time here, it's not a common sight um, here. They follow around population blooms of a mouse called a multi-mammate mouse. And only when you have these blooms of these little mice do you get white-faced owl coming into, into the area. All the rest are pretty sedentary. They'll move around. Grass owl, I suppose not as common as the wood owl would be, but definitely still find them here in place to place. So I hope that answered your question there, Amy. I'm testing my brain and my memory capacities today, which is a good thing. All right. And Ambula has just stood up, and I think that's a cue for you to go back there. Out of that. So <laughs> it might look a bit funny because we are at an incredible angle. 
very steep bank. There's a hyena here. Did he growl? It looks like he saw something. I wonder if there's a hyena moving here. No, I think he might have just been focusing on the spot. Now we are going to have to make space shortly. It's a very difficult area. You can't actually fit many vehicles in here. Now we can see him, is not as big a leopard as Tingana if you look at his neck. I'd say Tingana's probably got 15 kilos. What do you think, ma'am? 15. 10 kilos. 10, 15 kilos on him. So, 30 pounds or so. So Andrew's just arrived, so this is our last view of him for now. We'll try to come back a little bit later. Andrew, just stand by there and I'll move out for you. So while we move out, Cindy in Tennessee is wondering, do females still make moves at him? Look, seek him out to mate. They won't. They won't because he doesn't hold the territory, so he doesn't add any security for, her, for, for their cubs. So... I see that these gremlins are busy keeping you away from um, Vula and his dinner. That's a pity, but it's okay. You get to spend some more time with me on foot. Let's carry on going. We've now crossed into a block that is one of my favorite blocks here. Not because, I don't think it's, it's because it's any more uh, spectacular than any other block here. It just has such a range of different habitats. It goes from a deep drainage line, which is close to quarantine and, and quarantine included. And it sort of has this big middle area that is below a seep line which is quite rare and then it has this huge grassy crest where I found the pot on basically and then it descends to Impala Plains and then into the uh, uh, the drainage basin. Here we're in two different drainage basins where we're standing here now everything sort of faces uh, east and drains into the Mulwati which is in the basin that you see between here and far away on that side. That far range over there is the Mulwati's drainage line but on the on the eastern bank and then in this direction we've got a watershed here you can see where the sky becomes through the trees there it's probably about 400 or 500 yards from where we are now and when we crest that then we go into Manyaleti drainage line that's another massive river the Manyaleti and so this whole sort of range goes up crests and then goes into a different river system and you don't find a lot of different plants it's not the most botanically diverse part on Juma but it definitely for me has been the source of quite a lot of the very interesting sightings we've had over the last couple of weeks with you and it is where we've crossed into now because I like coming here and we're just going to get through this thicket of black monkey thorn have a look at these these guys you don't want to get hooked by I've shown you from time to time the thorns on these guys they are vicious and the closer you get to the center of the tree, the more vicious they actually become. It's got me. And it's got Brian. <laughs> and I'm, you know, one of the schoolboy errors you make is to dive in and grab it with your finger. But quite often what happens is it hooks you on the way out. Now what I like doing with these guys is making myself a tooth cleaner. I quite like clean teeth. And although they look quite viciously hooked they make for the wonderful they make for a wonderful picker you just break off the quite brittle thorn you don't want that stuck in your gum uh, did there and then you pick and you scrape in your teeth now I do it almost every day so I'm not hoping that I find massive amounts of detritus on this Actually, in fact, I hope I find none. It would be very embarrassing for me to show you that. But you can 
hook and it's almost like mother nature has provided you with the most perfect angle on that one of my uses for the black monkey song all right come through the amount of devastation that these elephants have done Patricia's just asked me, and hello Patricia, you just asked me if the elephants still eat the leaves that have become leathery on these combretums. Patricia, I've never seen them, I've never seen them eat dried leaves to be quite honest with you. They will eat dried grass. Dried grass um, does contain, very similar to the hay that you feed your horses, although the older it is, the less nutritious, the more they have to eat. But dried grass is significantly higher in, in, in nutrition than what leaves are. But they will be aiming, generally speaking, for the greener of the leaves and the grass that's left over. And then, as it starts getting even drier, not that it could get drier than this, but as we start heading deeper into the, into the, uh, the, 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 the dry season or the winter, we have elephants moving from about 80% of their diet being grass to 80% of their diet being wood. Woody branches, woody stems, bark, roots and bulbs. They'll move away from the leaves and the grass. And then as we swing back into the wet season again, which will happen in about November, then we start seeing a shift where elephants start shifting away from the woody species of plant and into grass again, where, we, where by January and December, these elephants are just literally ripping out massive trunkfuls of grass and shoving it into their mouths. But they really have had a dramatic effect on these landscapes. It's called terraforming and hippo and elephant are pretty much the only animals out here that can do terraforming at a macro level, at a, 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 a maxi level that we can see, a macro level that we can see. Have a look at the knocked over these trees here, roots and all. Cause of a huge debate amongst people that are deciding whether or not there's too many elephants or not. Now James Richard has asked an interesting question. Hello James. I haven't heard from you in a while, but I think it's with all the craziness that was TV, I couldn't speak to you. Um, you've asked at what age do baby elephants start stripping the, 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 the leaves off of trees and the, the, the bark? James, you see them acting or, or, or mimicking what their parents do from a very young age. From a, as little as three or four weeks old, they're already flopping their trunks around, but they don't have that much use of their trunk. At about six months old, their trunk is dexterous enough for them to start pulling up grass. But even at that age, they're still reliant on mom for milk. They're still reliant on, on, um, on only the, the choicest ends of the grass that they can get to, rather than having to, to fortify their entire nutritional need from woody species and then we start seeing from about six months where they start to do this to about two years where they're fully weaned where they start to strip off peels and chunks of bark but they'll only really get really good at that when they get big a female elephant they can debark trees they'll push over the smaller trees they'll break branches but it's the big bulls the big elephant bulls that are capable of pushing trees the size of these ones down as you see substantial trees with substantial root systems. Oh, Monique's asked an interesting question all the way out of London. Good evening Monique. You've asked do elephants clean their teeth with anything that they eat here. Monique, um, in the sense that they take a toothpick and they take an elephant sized toothpick and dig it into their teeth using their trunk, uh, not really, no. What they would do is they, I've seen them quite often blow water and blow muddy sand into their mouth. They'll, they'll take water and they scoop it up and they blow it quite forcibly into their mouth for no other reason than I can think of that they're just cleaning their teeth and they're cleaning a little bit of the detritus that collects. But other than that, no. They get about five different sets of molars, six, six molars in actual fact. So as soon as their teeth start getting all worn up and old, they usually fall out and are replaced with a fresher set, which makes it a lot easier to keep 
um, your dental hygiene in check, basically. All right. Brent is up and going again and I think is in a better signal area and I'm sure he's dying to let you know what Mbulo got up to before he left and we're going to send you over to him right now. See you later. So Mbulo rolled over once and then he went back to sleep. Unfortunately, it seems like not only is it a very difficult spot, you can only fit one car in there at a time, uh, there's also not great signal. It seems to be just in a little, in a, in a little black zone. So we've decided to leave him be, and there are quite a few other game drive vehicles who are trying to get there. So what we're going to do is head towards the hyena den and see what's happening on that part of Juma. And I might go to where we think Sindile is just opposite in Buffelzook uh, with a kill. So I'd keep watching the Juma dam cam. If he is on a kill there, the closest water is the Juma pan. And of course, me being me, I've managed to make a real tangle down here. There we go. Thank you very much, stations crossing back to the north. So I'm just letting all the guys in the west know that I'm changing game drive channels to the northern channel. Uh, so they don't try to call me and I not don't answer them and they think I'm rude. Uh, crossing back from the west, any updates in the north? Uh, crossing back from the west, any updates in the north? Copy, thanks, thanks. Um, um, I don't pile of planes, I'll check so around towards those. It's exciting, a report of wild dog tracks. Copy, thanks very much, Dex. Uh, is there anywhere you'd like me to check? Copy, will do. So, change of plans. There's a report of wild dog tracks uh, coming in. Thanks, Lex. I'll check Triple M. So we're going to go check. Apparently the tracks were coming in from the south. Uh, Lex is right there where the tracks were supposed to come in. Uh, he's going to have a look. Actually, it's not too far from Steph. So I think final control, if you let Steph know, to keep his eye open for wild dog tracks. And they came in on Shabam Road, apparently, and we were, we were there earlier, and then certainly weren't any wild dog tracks there. Now they do move so quickly, we haven't seen wild dogs in such a long time. How exciting would it be? So they could be coming through anywhere and we know how fast they move. Ah, in the tree? Yeah. Marrakeen? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure there's a bomb there. Okay. Come on. 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 So that's the Arethusa uh, Habitat team. So the guys who make sure the roads are all looked after and that. And he was just telling me about Mvula. I'm 
going to be checking on the road quite carefully. Debbie in Vancouver. Debbie said, oh, aren't most of the wild dogs denning? Could this be a dispersal pack? It could. It also could be a hunting party uh, from one of the denning packs. And they can cover a great distance when they are hunting. So it could also be a hunting party from one of the packs. seen any tracks yet and the other thing about wild dogs you can actually smell them you smell wild dogs them I don't smell wild dogs yet so even after they've passed through an area you can smell them they smell sort of like wet dog but I'm gonna keep checking carefully here for these wild dog tracks while we do that let's go see what Steph's up to Of course, Brent is going to be checking for the wild dogs. That type of excitement is what he lives for. But just have a look at this giant of a tree that this elephant has pushed over. I mean, it's a fully grown knobthorn. We get an idea of how thick, well, that root system that you're in at the moment, there the taproot is where it, where, it, uh, where it was snapped. But just have a look at this massive tree. I mean, I'm just able to touch my fingers on, on, on it. There we go. That diameter hardwood tree, I mean, that's from a knob thorn. These things will make an axe blunt in no time. Chainsaw blades, you have to sharpen your chainsaw blade. Every time you cut a section around, you get to about this much, you have to sharpen your chainsaw blade to chop up this guy. Awesome old tree. Of course, I know a lot of you love trees, I also love trees, but it, in my opinion it's necessary for these elephants to do what they're doing. They understand, genetically they understand the bush I feel a lot better than what we could. And they are doing what they're doing, they're compelled to do what they do for some reason. But this is the first time I've stood in the upper branches of a knobthorn tree. Landmark moment in an almost two decade long career, me standing in the top of a knobthorn. I don't think I've ever been in the top of a knobthorn, hey Brian? Um, and I'm only marginally sh taller than what Brian is at the moment when he's standing on the ground. No idea how tall he is. <laughs> All right, let's carry on. What a wonderful afternoon. We're we coming to this drainage line here. Good afternoon, Ramey. While we're wandering through this thicket of here, you've asked, what has happened to all the guinea fowl? That's actually a good question. I'd see guinea fowl quite a lot. I couldn't tell you where exactly was the last time I saw the last guinea fowl we saw here. They're still here, but you probably find that they are in a much smaller area or a much larger area. Let me just think about what I've just said there. The dry season animals tend to stick to a larger area because they need more area to forage. Those animals that can fly away will fly away. But generally speaking, the rest are all just here, just spread out, having to move quite a lot to find enough food to keep themselves going. So they're here. You'd, it'll be easier for you to see them on, on game drive. And I'm almost wanting to say that we've got a flock of them that hang around Juma. Hey, Brian, do you remember any around Juma? Mm, yeah, there was, apparently. There was, there is. This is an interesting plant. Uh, this particular plant underneath the ground, this is a Bushman's grape, or one of the grapes, I don't know which one exactly. And underneath the ground is a series of tubers that are connected by, by roots. So it's a ball of tuber with a root and another ball and a root and another ball. And so it spreads out all underneath the ground here. And the local witch doctors dig up, or not witch doctors, let me say, the local shamans is probably a better word to use, dig up this plant because they believe that this particular plant ties in 
all the medicine that they make. So when you're making bush medicine, when they're making bush cures and bush medicine, just for lack, it's disrespectful slightly that, that, that term, but when they're making their cures and their, their concoctions, they always add this plant in. And the theory is, is that because this has a clump of roots tied together with a, or a bulb tied together with a clump of roots, is that this acts as a binding agent. So when you're using a bit of this plant and a bit of that bark and a bit of this root and some of these leaves and you've got a bit of magic in there and you're burning it all together, you have to have this plant. Otherwise it won't work. Otherwise it'll just be a collection of different medicines that together don't give the cure to you. And it's only this plant that gives you that cure. So finding this plant outside of these reserves is a bonus for any of the shamans. Luckily, it's a fairly common plant. You see them almost, almost everywhere. I think that's quite a nice story, don't you? Mm. It's a nice story. The Bushman's Grape. All right, let's go and see what's happening in this drainage line here. To give you an idea, let's go and walk over there. To give you an idea how big that last knob thorn is that I showed you. Here's one that's standing, that's roughly the same size. <laughs> Have a look at that. that. That knob thorn that I was climbing in now is the same size as that. And I'll prove it by putting my arms around it and let's see if my fingers can touch. Let me go around. Oh, I'm falling all over the place today. Ah, oh, no, I think I've overestimated myself. No, nope, my fingers can't touch. This tree's bigger. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> In actual fact, this tree's much bigger. <laughs> uh, the joys of getting a bit older, not really knowing what you're talking about. <laughs> It looks the same size, I'll, I'll put it to you, <laughs> let's leave it there. Alright, it is a huge knob thorn though. And I got to give it a hug, which was a good thing. I like hugging big old trees. <laughs> uh. ah. We have... Now, Debbie, while I'm digging around here in this hole, you've asked me, do guinea fowl have a different call winter to summer? Debbie, I, I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm going to say no, probably not. Um, they probably have a breeding and a non-breeding call, and they probably have a whole lot of other calls for, um, for alarm. They definitely have alarm calls and they have contact calls. They have a whole variety of calls. But whether they have calls that are specific to a season, I don't think so. Not in my experience, at least, anyway. I'm trying to see if there's any moisture in the bottom of this. This is an elephant well. Elephant where they can dig out fresh water. And I'm trying to see here if there's any water here. Now let's see if the soil, there we go, a little bit. Here's the soil. Oh, not much. I probably have to have quite a big spade to get into the bottom of this and it's probably why the elephants stopped digging because they knew that the water was already gone. But have a look at how wonderful that is. Hey? These elephants definitely very clever. All right, let's carry on up and out of here. And have a look at this wonderful sunset with the clouds all over it. That's beautiful. And on that note, I'm going to send you over to Brent. We've got an update for you. Well, unfortunately, those were not wild dog tracks. They were actually young hyena tracks. So we've rushed. Uh, two of us have rushed here, and unfortunately, there were no, not going to be any wild dogs. 
but I'm still in the mood for some carnivals. So I am going to try and make my way towards the hyena den before it gets too late. But it's just such glorious light coming through. And there's a male impala who's on uh, now steps. <laughs> steps directly out of the light as we stop. Okay, thank you to you. You were standing in such beautiful light. And now you run away. Okay, well, hang on, let me get untangled. So we're going to start moving towards the hyena den. Uh, fingers crossed uh, that they're all there. What are you staring at? Are you looking at me? spotted something else. You see how alert they are in this wind. Ah, <laughs> I think they spotted a Franklin in the bush. Just the movement would have made them stop for that little second. And there comes the Franklin out of the bush that they were staring at, eating some grass seeds. Wow, this is a big group of kudu. Uh, how many think we got here? There's one, two there. Three, four. And there's five. And we go to the right, six. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve that I can see. Wow, what a lovely big group of kudu. It does pay to be alert with all the predators that are about. Bye, guys. Don't get eaten. Or if you do, wait for me to be there. There's actually more now. 13, 14. Wow. All right, girls. So we're going to hit that hyena then. I'm sure a few of you would think it's a good idea. Hello again, Debbie in Vancouver. Debbie says, how you doing? Excellent. I agree, Debbie. Um, Debbie would also like to know, how old will that hyena cub be before it starts coming out regularly? Probably around a month till we regularly see it, uh, with maybe coming out when its mom's not there. But for now, we're only going to be seeing it when its mom's around. Just listening, it sounds like they've just found the two Birmingham's and two in Kahumas, but deep into Buffalo's Hook. I was just trying to get an exact location there. But it's really nice to see him Vula today and look at see him looking so fat and happy. And Zoe commented, she just loves seeing the old boy in Vula. Yes, he is still a spectacular animal. And he did give us incredible sightings when he was the dominant male on Juma. Hi, Kyle. And Kyle 
Well, like, so if it's possible that the Anderson male will start pushing Tingana. Uh, and he already did. He's the, the reason Tingana moved into Mvula's area originally, uh, as Anderson pushed him out of what was his territory. But rather than fight Anderson, uh, Tingana thought it would be better to pick on the old man, and that's what he did. Oh, hello, zebras. Oh, it seems like everything's coming out and about as we get closer to the sunset. Zebra and wildebeest. A single wildebeest. They are just exquisite animals. They do look slightly bemused at times. Oh, of course, the zebras are far more closely related to a donkey than a horse, who, of course, stem from a similar ancestor. And there's the wildebeest with his back to us. Okay, well, we'll leave the grazers to graze. And hopefully the hyenas will be at home. While we make our way towards the hyena den, let's go see what Steph's up to. Welcome back to the bushwalk, everyone. I've got some ant lines here. And I always like this time of the day to figure out exactly when these ant lions stop their activities. Now this looks active. So what I'm doing is I'm, there we go, there we go. You see that? Come inside here, have a look. Can you see there? Now what we'll do is we'll play like we're an ant, watch ya. There we go, flick, flick, flick. Flicking the sand. <laughs> How awesome is that? And on the head, they've got this vicious pair of pincers that they grab anything that comes in. <laughs> flick, flick, flick. Let's see if we can get him free. Looks like a big one. So I'll stir up there. There we go. There's his pincers. That's what he was using to flick with. Sitting with his head up. Isn't that awesome? And basically getting enough energy to metamorphosize into a thing that looks very similar to a dragonfly. Can you believe it? So do yourself a favor. There you go. So see him now looking they dig one of their pits very quickly he'll be able to dig his hole redig his hole very quickly again I'm actually gonna put him back in the same one so don't worry about what I did these guys live in the sand they need to be able to be, be cope with animals and elephants stepping on their pieces of patch so there we're gonna put him in his hole and he very quickly will dig up that again but do yourself a favor and go and have a look at what an antlion turns into they will turn it, they turn into the most unbelievable um, flappy dragonfly. They would call them, they're not damsel flies, they're just ant lions, ant lion, ant lion adults. But to go from that little guy there that's a terror, subterranean terror, to a flappy, nocturnal, beautiful dragonfly type thing is quite a remarkable metamorphosis. Oh, it's turning into a lovely evening. Mm. MG Photography. It's an interesting name. Uh, you've just asked me when was the last time I saw a kingfisher. 
That's a good question there, MG Photography. It give me a while to think about when the last time is I saw a kingfisher. Mm, I heard a striped kingfisher last weekend. That's what, not this weekend now, the weekend before that. I haven't seen a brown hooded kingfisher or a striped kingfisher, which, which are the only kingfishers barring a pied kingfisher and the giant kingfisher, which are still here. Um, so a while back, let's say I heard one two weeks ago. The last time I saw a kingfisher was probably about two months ago. And that's because where we are now in the low felt is just way, way, way too dry for the insects that these birds need. And birds have wings, and because they have wings, they fly away. And I would imagine that they are in areas which have a little bit more grass, which have a little bit more water. So malachite kingfishers, pied kingfishers, and giant kingfishers would move to the water. And striped kingfishers and brown hooded kingfishers would move to thicker bush that has a higher grass load that supports more insects at this time of year. And I have no doubt that they've moved over to those patches there. It's a good question actually. It's a nice observation. It's like an observation James made a couple of weeks ago, months ago now, um, about how there have been so few cuckoos this year. Cuckoos came in, it didn't rain, and they left again. Then we had a little bit of rain and the cuckoos came back, and then they left again. So nice. Yes, Brent's definitely having a large mammal day. He's just let me know that he's got a tawny surprise for you. Enjoy that. <laughs> Gee. Look at that. Sun setting. We were on our way to the hyena den. I just said to Vim, I cannot see a single impala on quarantine. And we started looking and there's three lionesses. I'm not sure who they are. I know there's two lionesses in Buffalo's Hook at the moment. So I think it could be the other three in Kahuma girls. I'm not 100% sure. This is very, very interesting. I mean, we have had no lion tracks on the property today. Only those pro tracks we've had leaving this morning, but none in this western and central area. But it just, it's so funny, I just the lioness was looking up over the grass, otherwise we might have missed it. Wow. Oh. Who do you think they are, Vim and Kormas? Yeah, I think in Kormas as well. I'm just going to move around so we can have a look at that faces, maybe we'll see the amber-eyed lioness. Andrew, what's your position? Andrew, there's three one side ten gala on quarantine. I think so. Um, I've just, just seen them now. Look at that, isn't that gorgeous? I'm just gonna... Look at that. Where did you girls come from? Did you sneak through in the, from the north in this windy weather today? They're looking re relatively well fed. Isn't this exciting? Uh, Vim and I, our plans have changed. It's definitely getting to the right time of the day when they might move. I think, <laughs> depending on where Steph is, he might need a lift home. Isn't this exciting? Lions! Now, I don't think we and I were expecting lions at all. No, not at all. But that's the most incredible thing. We are live in the African bush. You cannot predict what's going to happen next. Now, I'd love to see the bellies of all three. I can only see the belly of all that one who's just slightly looking at us there through the grass. And she doesn't look like she is lactating. And it's going to be difficult to see if she's just full, possibly pregnant. Mm, 
Jenny says none look pregnant, but oh, Jenny, remember, some might have given birth. So we actually need to see them standing up and have a look at their, their nipples to tell. And also, it's very difficult to judge the weight um, of a lioness lying down. So once they're standing up, you'll be able to see where the, the weight is, and that'll be able to tell us whether they're pregnant or not. So the weight seems to sit a little bit further back on a pregnant female than it does on a male. Oh, they're on, on a, a non-pregnant female. Males, of course, can't get pregnant. Lex, Lex. Come on, girls, time to go hunting. Up and at him. None of this laying about. Of course, that's not how it works. Uh, lions sleep on average for about 20 hours a day. Must have come through from the north. And Don is just noting how well they blend into the background. If we look at the lioness who's lying off a little bit to the right, uh, can you see her? Oh, I see when Vim zooms in, you see that tawny color walk works really well in the winter months. There she is. Now this windy weather and, and it being quite cool is going to be beneficial to them. It means they're going to be able to move around a bit more as well as also the scent will be spread and spread around. Also, the hearing of the animals that they would like to hunt is going to be compromised in this weather. Hello, Sean in Secunda. And Sean is referring to the visible spots you can see on this lioness, on, on actually quite a few of them. And the spots are generally more pronounced in younger animals or, or cubs. And so Sean's wondering, oh, does this mean they're young? Not at all. Most adult lionesses will carry spots through to, uh, or will carry spots throughout their life. Uh, they're just far more pronounced when they're cubs. And the reason they have those spots as cubs is to make them less easy to, to find. So when they're hidden uh, by their mothers, uh, those spots help them blend into the bush. They're very, very flat cats at the moment. Can you just be on the radio for a second? Standing by. from uh, western side of quarantine. I have no idea where they came from. I didn't see any in console this morning or this afternoon. Uh, Taxon says they come from nowhere. The magical flying lines of Juma. Very tired, Kitty. I'm just going to move around a bit. I want to just see if we can move and get a look at her tummy. She's in the... No, she's tightening into a ball from the wind. That's not really going to help us see if you're, you've had babies, madam. She's very much in a kitty cat ball there. This looks like amber eyes, don't you think, them? Yeah? 
Yes, I think it is. It is amber eyes. Let's go forward a bit so you can, that bush is out of the way. Here we go. There we go. That's amber eyes. But the most exquisite eyes when she decides to open them, of course. give you an idea of exactly where we are. I'm going to ask VM to zoom out now from the sleeping kitty cat. Let's go wide. Okay, so um, the DRC is right there. And then you can actually see the final control antenna from where we're sitting. Go ahead. A firm uh, three females. But while we sit with the sleeping cats, let's go across to Steph with another type of predator. Uh, uh, let's go and let's go and find her. <laughs> Sorry. We, we said we need to show you this little bird of prey and then it flew away as you were crossing, but it's landed just there. Come with. Let's see if we can find him for you. I think this little bird, it's either a little banded goshawk or a little sparrow hawk. They both generally hunt quite small birds and insects mainly. And I'm just hoping that we can get to show you them. They, they're for me some of the best little birds around because they're so fierce. They just got this energy about them, this flitting energy. Let's see where he landed over here. Just, just, just flew through these bushes. Probably sitting watching us in this tree right now. Let's see if I can see him. They're not too scared about landing on the ground. Generally, these little birds of prey that hunt over here are hunting blue waxbills, are hunting the little camaropteras, the little prinias that are around here. But for the life of me, cannot find him. Let's see if we could go here. Probably walked straight past him, knowing, knowing my bad eyesight. But we don't waste too much of your time with us. Have a look at that sunset through those trees. That is by far a much prettier sight than watching the back of my shiny bald head search for a bird that is in all likelihood flown straight away. <laughs> it's pretty, eh? A sort of peachy colored sky. Been, been quite a cloudy day today. We've got a cold front come in. The nice thing about the cold front is by the time it gets here it's not actually that cold. It actually brings the temperature down to a bearable temperature. And at sunset I'm still walking around in shorts and a t-shirt. Whereas when this, when this particular cold front uh, hit the country it caused so much rain in the Western Cape that dams rose 5%. Can you believe it? That the dams on average in the Western Cape, which is right on the southern point of South Africa, rose 5% with just this cold front that's hitting us now. No rain, unfortunately, here. This is the very dry low felt. But as you can see from my attire, not too cold at all, which is exactly how I like it. I can't get cold. It's something that I've never been able to get used to and can't stand. I'm definitely a bushman's bushman. I enjoy the hot dry weather. Alright, let's carry on going. We're not going to waste our time looking for that little bird anymore. While we meander through the giant trees that are on top of quarantine, getting back to where we stay before those lioness start hunting us on top of quarantine, <laughs> wouldn't that be a sight? No. Brian... <laughs> <laughs> Liz, there's no one picking us up at the moment. We are walking home. I'm not too worried about lions on an open area while we've still got some light. That will change substantially as the minutes grow towards darkness. We'll still walk back to camp. Um, lions generally in the day leave people behind. It's only really at night time that they get their bravery increases. Not that they needed more bravery, these lions, but their bravery towards humans increases dramatically. And lions become quite inquisitive at night time. I remember quite fondly one of the wilderness camps I've been in 
I was snuggled up in my sleeping bag in a riverbed and I felt some sand tickling my head. And when I looked up, there was a lioness staring down at me on top of this, on top of this embankment. And I quickly rounded up everyone and we sat huddled together next to the fire. And this lioness walked down this game path, literally walked right up to us on the other side of the fire, promptly ate, my, ate one of my, my uh, guests piece of meat that he had on a plate next to the fire and then knocked my coffee over and then that gave her a fright it was warm coffee and she ended up leaving after that needless to say I slept like a baby that night knowing full well that eight people were keeping watch for me for the rest of the night wide awake <laughs> uh, wonderful memory that all right Okay, now, so we need to start making our way into the darkness and away from these lines. I'm gonna send you over to Brent, he's not too far away. You might even get to see us in the back of his car. He's there somewhere. See you later. <laughs> so the lions haven't moved much at all. They're still snoozing on the western edge of the quarantine caves and Steph's not too far away from us on his way home. Friendly Frank, uh, and Friendly Frank's a relatively new viewer, only been watching for two weeks, and this is the first Lions Friendly Frank has seen. And Friendly Frank would like to know how many lions are in the park, and do they have names like the leopards? Oh, what's that? A bird of prey. I can't really see it. It was a bit quick. Turn, turn for me. I don't know what that was. It was just, I can't, didn't get a good visual before it disappeared. It looked like probably a brown snake eagle, but uh, it was a bit quick. Sorry about that, friendly Frank. And here we go, I'm going to open. So the lions, we don't refer to them generally as individuals unless there's uh, something really distinct. Uh, like that one lioness in this pride has the amber eyes. We normally refer to the prides and this is the Inkauhuma pride, which is named after a tree. The first time they were ever seen was under a brown ivory tree, which is in Shangan, an Inkauhuma tree. But in terms of how many lions we have, sorry, I'm just getting my nocturnal lights there we go just adding a bit more light for them to work with there uh, this pride at the moment consists of five lionesses and three cubs confirmed three confirmed cubs and this is the main pride we see on safari live we do also see another pride of lions called the sticks pride and they consist at the moment of three females, and I think it was 11 cubs last count, but I could be wrong on that. And the male lions we see most regularly is a coalition of male lions called the Birmingham Boys, and there are four of them at the moment. There were five. One died from injuries it got while hunting buffalo. Now, every now and then we see a couple of other prides, the Tsalala pride, uh, the Mangen pride, but we don't see them too often. They're really in the peripheries around Arethusa, we sometimes see them. But in terms of the Sabi Sands, in total, there's probably just under 100 lions in the whole reserve.
Oh. So I'm just listening to the, the radio. Now, these three lionesses have caused great confusion because everyone assumed those lions and buffles hook, lionesses and buffles hook for the Inkahuma ladies, but now they think they might not be. So there we go. Uh, a different set of lions, uh, probably possibly the Talamati or Torchwood prides. I've never I've seen the Talamati pride once. I've never seen the Torchwood pride, but uh, they're very interesting. So we we know for a fact that one of these lionesses has three cubs in a den in Torchwood. Ooh, morning. Now, this is a good sign. We want to start seeing some stretching, scratching, yawning. That's the precursor to the moving. Oh, big yawn. Oh, wonderful. Now, Bugsy's wondering, does the ter terrain change and weather change in winter uh, change the hunting times for the predators? I mean, they do. They tend to get going a little bit earlier, but not, not too much, Bugsy. They're still opportunists, and they will take any opportunity, whether it be at midnight or 12 midday. But generally, the time they will hunt is from now. Uh, we'll focus on hunting from any time from now on. Uh, to the first two hours beyond darkness and then again a similar time in the early morning but they do hunt throughout the night if they are really hungry. Ooh, another yawn coming. Now this looks to be the youngest lioness to me, it's starting to get hard to tell her apart from the others. Uh, she's getting big. She has been seen well, pseudo-mating uh, with the Birmingham boys. But we're going to stay here, see what these lions get up to. And uh, Steph should be nearly home, so he's going to say goodbye. And we'll be back shortly. I am almost home. Thank you very much, Brent. So we're all safe and sound. We can actually see the vehicles down there. We'll close off by saying, I just want to say thank you very much for a wonderful afternoon with you. We've had a fantastic day, to be quite honest with you. I had a I mean, nice question with that Birchall's Glossy Starling, which I still think is the reason for those millipede segments in that nest. That was the quiz of the day. And then tracking that male leopard through that bush today was something quite spectacular, I must be honest. Here you can see the lions over my shoulder. I'll show you that. I'm not going to zoom in too deep. I don't quite know who's on the back of those vehicles, but I can see the, uh, the aerial sticking out there. We're probably standing about 250 yards away from the lions and about 100 yards away from our camp. So we're not too far away from, uh, from safety. I doubt that it's that time of the day yet where, uh, where, uh, where they'll be hunting people too badly. But I definitely am not going to be wandering out of the campsite to phone my wife later. I think I'll try and do that from James's tree, which is in the middle of our staff village. And he climbs it to get the necessary height that he needs to make the phone calls that he does. I think there is wisdom in what Mr. Hendry does there. While we make our way back up to the camp, come along. Alrighty. And Brent's ready to receive you for his part, the rest of the safari. And I just want to say cheers, Brian. Thank you very much for all your hard work. Here we go. <laughs> all the best. See you next time. Well, we, of course, we're going to stick with these lines. I'm hoping they're going to move shortly. And remember, if you are a new viewer and you want to ask us anything about the Inkaoma ladies, you can do that by using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or uh, send us an email to questions at wildearth.tv. Only one lioness is starting to show sort of signs of getting moving. I'm hoping the others follow suit quite shortly. Now, 
Yes, I think she's going to get up and go greet the other females. Now, she definitely looks a bit more hungry than the other lioness. And I am quite sure it is the youngest lioness. And I go, quite often we'll just flop down on the other lions, try to convince them it's time to get moving. Now, we're going to see some, oh, there we go, some nice stretching, hopefully, some aloe grooming. Now, grooming between pride members is very important. And it helps strengthen the bonds of the pride, but there we go. Well, you can offer yourself up as a pillow instead. I'm just going to move the vehicle around a little bit to make it a bit easier for them. And we're going to go around the long way to the other side. What do you think, Vim? Vim likes journeys. There we go. Jean. Jean's in North Carolina. Uh, Jean would like to know how far are these lions from the Juma Dam camp? Well, Jean, not far at all, probably two, three hundred meters at the most. I'm quite certain if they are thirsty, they probably will pop in there. Second lioness showing a little, oops, sorry, my head in the way there. Showing a little few signs that they might get moving. Now, of course, we've all spent many, many hours, uh, those of you who've been on Safari Live with us for a while, sitting next to sleeping cats. But playing the patience game is worthwhile with big cats. So, here we go, back to snoozing. Hi, Romy. Uh, Romy's in Ohio. Romy would like to know if the female only mates with one of the male lions in the male lion coalition. Will the cubs be in danger from the other members of the coalition? They won't, Romy. Um, those cubs should be perfectly safe. That's the only time they'd really be in danger if there was a pride takeover or they happened to come across some nomadic male lions. Now, they aren't very, very comfortable at the moment. I don't think they're going to be doing too much moving. Big Safari Live welcome to Brock in Pennsylvania. And Brock's wondering, do we ever see male lions without manes? Well, Brock, it is possible. I haven't ever seen a maneless male lion in this part of the world. I've seen them in southern Tanzania before. And of course, some of the more famous maneless male lions around uh, were the man-eaters of Savo. And those male lions, Hollywood even got involved with and made a movie about, very loosely based on the truth. I even created a new character that doesn't exist in the book. Uh, the basic story about that is uh, the colonial government, uh, the English colonial government, started building a railway line. It was often referred to as the suicide line. Now, it was called that because 
uh, it was deemed absolutely su suicidal to, to build a railway line from the Kenyan coast all the way to Lake Victoria. And at one particular point on this, they got held up by the building of a bridge. And while they were building this particular bridge, uh, there was an outbreak of man-eating lions. Now, these man-eating lions were probably more than the two that um, is, is said that they were. And there was a British engineer or in the engineering corps, and he was the one who eventually shot them, not after they killed an estimated of just under 100 people. It was two young male lions, um, maneless as well. And if you live in the U.S., you can actually go see the, the man-eaters of Savo. Uh, they're in the Chicago Field Museum. So any of our viewers in Chicago, you want to go look at the most famous man-eating lions in Africa, go have a look. They're on display in Chicago. Now, generally, lions are not man-eaters. Uh, it's normally old or injured or, or young ones that become man-eaters. And uh, actually some of the more famous man-eaters in the world actually in South Africa. Now, we are on the western edge of the Kruger National Park. The eastern edge of the Kruger National Park is the country of Mozambique. And it was in civil war for many, many years. And it caused a lot of people to try flee the civil war. And the refugees and that would try and illegal immigrants would try and jump on Mount Josie, jump to Johannesburg. And they would use the Kruger National Park. And in certain areas, prides and lions took to hunting the people as they crossed the park, trying to get out of the war-torn Mozambique. Still happens today with illegal immigrants, believe it or not. And uh, it's estimated that, that in the, along the whole couple of hundred kilometer boundary of the Kruger, anything from 50 to 100,000 people have been being eaten by lions since the 60s. Scary stuff. But, of course, when we're on safari, as you can see, these lions are completely oblivious, oblivious to us and the vehicles. Now, the reason those illegal immigrants and, and refugees were eaten is because they were moving around at night. During the day, a lion will run away from you 99.99% of the time you walk into them. They are actually quite, during all day lion hours, they're quite big chickens, especially the males. Nighttime is a different thing. We have evolved alongside lions. We have evolved to be the dominant diurnal predator. Lions are the domin dominant nocturnal predator. That's why you want to get home when it gets dark, because you know there's bad things out there. Now that's an instinctive response from when we used to live in caves. At the moment, we just have a lion pal. Now, out of all the big cats, lions are probably the least big of the man-eaters, or least well-known of the man-eaters. Probably the most famous man-eating cat is a tiger. And the tiger, be day or night, man falls into his realm, his sphere of prey. Now, Sandy is wondering, do lions ever worry about scorpions and things? Not really, Sandy. I think they probably get stung a few times in their life, but uh, most scorpions out here, even if they sting us, it's just very painful. It's like a bee sting that doesn't go away and becomes very itchy. There's very few actual dangerous scorpions, and the only dangerous scorpion that occurs in this, this part of the world is a Parabethus transvolicus. And uh, I've never actually seen one in the Sabi Sands. I've seen plenty uh, in the Kruger and in the Timbavanti, but never ever in the Sabi Sands. And then, these lines are not looking like they're going to move too soon, but we definitely have to play the patience game. You never know, there could be some animals around the pan. So, if we have a closer look at the back of their ears, you'll notice they're nice and dark, very, very black. Now, that is a following mechanism for cubs. They've also got a black tip to their tail. Now, there's very interesting studies being done at the moment by actually a few people I know. And they're looking at the visual uh, significance of visual signs in, in big cats, or in, particularly in cooperative hunting in, in lions. So I truly believe, having watched lions for as many years as I have, that they do take visual cues from each other during the hunt. 
uh, rather than audio cues which might give away their presence. So definitely judging on what the other animal's doing, uh, how the ears move, maybe how the tail moves, the lions definitely react to that. And of course, at the moment, they're reacting to nothing and not even moving a muscle, apart from the little flick of the ear, the last few little annoying biting flies around. Now I'm being put under the cosh by Genevieve. Hi Genevieve, Genevieve's in New York. And Genevieve said, I've seen so much in my life. If I had to nail down one sighting to say, this is Africa, what would it be? Uh, Genevieve, I would, I'm gonna have to say that's impossible. I mean, Africa is such a diverse place and, and, and the animals are so diverse and there's so many different things out here. that I would say I, I couldn't ever uh, do one sighting. I mean, you've got gorillas, to lions, to, to elephants, to chimpanzees, to whales, um, hippopotamus, and uh, a carpy, uh, Congo peacocks. There's uh, so many endemic and incredible species to, to Africa. I don't think I could ever nail down one site and say this is Africa. But um, I think when you're with any of the iconic species, and uh, male lion roaring is probably definitely one of the things that screams, this is Africa, and the whole car starts vibrating. Uh, being a, having a big elephant bull stand over you, and you know this massive animal, oh, we've got some movement on the lions, that this massive animal could, if it wanted to at any time, completely pulverize you, it chooses not to. And that's it, this is Africa. Even this and seeing these intimate moments between these three lionesses as they snooze and cuddle on a cold winter's evening. This is Africa. I see Genevieve, I think I could probably keep going for 10 years with little anecdotes like that. Isn't it? See the strength of the wind, the grass moving around. Now, these little intimate sessions between lionesses are very important for the survival of the pride. And the closer-knit team they are, and the more likely the pride is to survive. Now, the one on her back cuddling is, I think it's Amber Eyes. Yes, it is Amber Eyes, if I remember correctly from how they were lying earlier. Hi Zoe. Uh, Zoe's wondering if it's noticeable, do the big cats sleep more during the winter months? I would say the opposite, Zoe. They sleep more during the summer months. When it's cool, they're able to move around, um, but when it's hot, they can't move around. They, they battle to diffuse heat. So if their core body temperature even raises by a few degrees, that's the end of a lion's life. So during the hot summer months, they, they're less likely to, to move around and, and, and push the, that core body temperature. And you'll see, if you keep watching, Zoe, how uncomfortable they are in summer. And they just sit there panting. And they just look really, really uncomfortable. Oops, I'm just going to get my blanket out. It's getting quite chilly for my legs. Oh, we have movement. Some rolling. This is all good stuff. Uh, I would like to see signs that are a bit, bit more energetic, but this is how it starts. You can see really nice hunting weather for them. Cloud cover overhead good strong wind. And hopefully these ladies will have some success this evening. I think there's 
what's incredible, these lines can go flat like this to to literally action stations in a split second. It could be a buffalo that wanders on. I did see tracks of a herd of buffalo that came on to Juma, sort of due south of us, almost exactly where we had Karula's tracks crossing out. Uh, Mike in Florida is wondering, when was the last time we saw Junior? Now, for those of you who don't know Juniors, Junior is the young male who used to be part of this pride. So when males get to about three years old, they're pushed out of the pride and they need to go find their own space and, and only wander around for a few years. Uh, and sometimes they will join up with other males to form coalitions. Sometimes they take the sneaky option and sort of mate on the peripheries and, and never really hold a, a home range or a territory. But uh, Junior, I, I'm not sure when the last time he was seen. Uh, Mike, to be honest, it was a couple of weeks ago uh, on Sibambili. What have you seen, Vim? I saw Vim suddenly looking this way, so I was hoping he might have spotted a wildebeest or a buffalo or something. Moving on, those zebra and wildebeest we saw weren't too far from here. So you can see there's the quarantine clearings. And there's often animals that move up onto those clearings to sleep at night because it's more open and they've got a better chance of being able to stay away from the lions and spot them from a distance. Isn't that incredible? Right on our sort of back door, three lioness. Not very active lioness, but no, nevertheless, yeah, they are definitely lions. Uh, I was just keeping quiet there for a second. I was trying to listen and see if I could hear any potential prey species around. Now, if we do have a lot of first-time viewers with us, uh, or relatively new viewers who haven't been on a lion hunt just yet, now, if the lions are hunting at night, and this is the same for any of the predators, <coughs> excuse me, we won't keep the lights on. So if we see them go into stalk mode, we switch off the lights. So we don't want to give away the lion's position, and we also don't want to blind the animals and make it easier for the lions to catch them. We're here to observe, not to interfere. Now, we can see that very distinct little white streak on the base, or paler streak, it's not really white, on the base of that lioness's eye. Now, that's to help her capture the ambient light. So lions are not true, they can't truly see in the dark. Uh, they have incredible night vision, but it, it, it only works if there's ambient light from the stars and the moon or clouds. So they can't see in, without, within the absence of light. Oh, there we go. Some rolling. So that female looks like she's actually eaten and the other two not so much. Now they could have been split from each other and only recently joined up again. So here there's some wonderful stream, screenshots coming out, remember to share those with us, uh, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or on our Facebook page, Safari Live. And I know you all have wonderful groups as well, Juma Junkies, Safari Live, Vidin, Vidin Picks. So please keep sharing all those wonderful screenshots and videos that you guys make from the live drives. Hi, well, another question from Roger in Tampa. Hi, Rog. Uh, Rog would like to know, do these local lions uh, ever attempt small elephants? Uh, I've never seen it, uh, Roger. It's, it's always possible, but a lot of 
behavior, like lion behavior, is area specific rather than animal specific. So the lions here yeah, tend to focus more on buffalo, uh, giraffe, zebra, and, and anything smaller than that. And the only place that lions are really famous for focusing on elephants is in northern Botswana, uh, along the Savuti, uh, Kwanda, and Chobi areas. Now there are a lot of elephants there. Uh, you can see easily in an hour, first hour of game drive, you can see a thousand, thousand two hundred, thousand three hundred elephants uh, without pushing yourself too much. Now in certain areas, um, when the dry season comes, a lot of the other prey species move away and, and only the elephants are around. And there have been prides of lions that have learnt basically how to hunt. And not only small elephants, I mean 14, 15, 16 year old elephant bulls, but it is incredible. Uh, very big prides as well. And it's amazing, as soon as the Savuti channel started flowing again, and so I thought I heard something, no, I think, and the Savuti marsh filled up again, and that kept zebra and impala and, and, and lechwe and, and, and sesame and other animals close around that area. Uh, those prides split into smaller prides again uh, and, and stopped hunting uh, elephants. Oh, we had a head movement. Come on, ladies, time to get up. Oh, there we go, yawn. I mean, it's possible they've moved a big distance during the day today. There we go, the more yawns we see, the more likely they are to move shortly. Now, of course, we're on a live safari, so we can't poke them with a stick, get them going, or cut to the next exciting bit. We've got to play the patience game. But we are able to now witness lion behavior in real time. I mean, you are watching these lions at the same time as me. There was a little bout of yawning there, and I feel it might not have been quite enough. Oh yes, head up. That's what we need. We like heads up. Oh, yawn coming. Another one on the ground. <laughs> Pour to the face. And a stretch and a back to sleep. Oh, let's move around to that one his. when he's grooming. Hi, Jason. And Jason says that pose could fool you into thinking that they're quite friendly. And Jason, during the day, they scaredy cats. Uh, and at night, they're very brave cats. So it's actually almost like they're different animals uh, during day and night. The other thing is during the day, because it's, it's so much warmer, and they aren't able to get rid of a lot of their heat. So that's another reason that they are more nocturnal. How's that, VM? So like all cats, lions are avid groomers. And being social cats, they practice aloe grooming, which is when they groom each other. And most aloe grooming will take place on the face and the back of the neck, where they're unable to reach themselves. So evolutionary, uh, there's a couple of evolutionary reasons for this. One is probably because they weren't, they were not able to groom there themselves. Uh, and secondly, uh, for the bringing in the closeness of the pride. Uh, 
Uh, that's the female who looks like she might have eaten a bit more than the other two. Uh, Cecilia says Tuesday snooze day. Yes, well, these lions are definitely snoozing or oh, having a scratch. Now, lions are full of parasites and fleas, ticks, mites, uh, tape worms, fluke worms, all sorts of nasty creatures. So even though they look quite clean, they are quite smelly. And the last place you really want to be is downwind from a lion after a large meal of buffalo. Cleaning, cleaning, cleaning. The other two are snoozing, snoozing, snoozing. Lion logs in the background. Oh, lovely shot, Liam. Hi, Mike. Mike is in Florida, and uh, Mike's wondering, do we have any plans for night drives in the near future? Oh, you're going to have to watch this space, Mike. We might be testing some fun equipment in the next short while. So, yes, there are plans to take to the darkness. Which lion is making that? It's just snoring. It always sounded like a growl, but it's a snore. Lazy creature. Why, why no one looks like they're growling, but there was literally a snoring lion. No, don't do that. No, no. Oh. <laughs> there we go. There's some aloe grooming happening. Not too much, though. Oh, there we go. A little bit more movements. I love it when they stretch. Just look at that. Look at that. It's so exquisite. Someone's hit a switch. I wonder if they've, oh, jeepers. There's an Impala that has just run straight into the lines. Um, I've got to go all lights off, sorry, Vim. Um, there's an Impala that's running almost straight towards us. Now, I'm just gonna shine on the ground here, Vim, so you can just have a look how that, like, those lionesses have changed and how quickly. Just so you can see their body language. Okay. That's a very silly Impala. Um, he's stopped probably exactly where VM's showing you there, but you can't really see, but if VM comes out, he's just on the other side of that tree, that marula tree there. And that's the thing about this, with this wind, that the impala, the sense of smell's compromised, it's, it's, its sense of hearing's compromised, and I mean, an impala would be quite a small meal for these three, but would take it, they are opportunists. Uh, the Impala is moving away from them now. Uh, he hasn't seen them, otherwise he'd be snorting. Yeah, there's a lioness, but you can't really see it. I don't know if you can see that, but there's a lioness literally just off my bonnet. There she is. There's just that light patch you can see there. That's her moving towards the Impala. I can just make them out with my, my eyes and I can't see the Impala anymore. 
it's gone into some bushes. I'm going to try and describe what's happening. And there is just a slight bit of ambient light that my, my eyes can still see. Uh, and I'm afraid the camera can't pick up. So there's one lioness right here. The other two are still just behind my head from where you are. The wind's got stronger. The lions, the lions, the lions are going. Uh, they're moving quite quickly now. Two of the lionesses are uh, moving towards where that last saw that impala. There's a bush between them. They're using the bush. Uh, they're using the bush. So, sorry, I'm not looking at the camera. I'm just watching and, and trying to just eke out the last little bit of light with my eyes. Uh, and they're probably about 30 yards. No. 30 feet, 40 feet from me. The last place I saw the Impala was probably 60, so they've covered half the distance. And they're still going. It was a male Impala, by the way. Now, if they do catch it, I do warn any of our sensitive viewers, this will be very graphic. A three lionesses on an Impala will be a big fight, and they'll, they'll rip it open quite quickly. So just, if you are a little bit sensitive, just beware that there might be some graphic images shortly. This is why you play the patience game. Now one lioness is still lying right in front of the vehicle. I'm just gonna use the base. Okay, I can't see, so that light view. And the one lioness is now moving off. Oh, there we go. Now I can see. Sorry about the dark. Um, but with the light on, I just can't see what's going on. Now, the lioness is basically moving straight towards where Fireside Chat was. So there we go. That towards that marula tree. She was just behind that tree the last time I saw her. And I'm only seeing her when she moves now because it's so dark. So I've only got visual of one line SVM. Can you see the others yet? Still? Negative. Negative, yeah. So there's one, the youngest line S looks like she's. I'm just going to do a quick sweep with the spotlight. So it doesn't. Okay. There's one line S. I can only see two line S's. The third has gone off to the east of us. either going to hear that snort of an impala who spotted a predator or we'll hear a sort of like a big tackle imagine a, a thumping football tackle that's the sort of sound you can imagine me listening for now with an animal small as an impala it's very unlikely it'll make any noise before the lioness gets it under control Another quick flash. One line, this is up. I'm just going to move away from where this one's lying in front of me. I'm just going to put myself in a position that if anything happens, uh, we'll be in the right spot. And I wish, I really wish we could show this to you, but as I say, we don't want to affect uh, the outcome here. And thanks very much, Jen, um, who's in Minnesota. And, oh, it's over. All the snorting just happened. She's been spotted. Her body language has changed. And Pyla spotted her. So, good news is, for those of you who like watching the Juma dam cams, that's where she's heading at the moment. Now, is there anything at the pan at the moment? I'd love to know. Let me know. Is there anything at the Juma pan at the moment? And if there is, uh, you can let me know. Let me just get on the radio. Stations is through one Satyangala, now mobile. Uh, northeast through the middle of quarantine.
Uh, copy, they're going to pretty much go, I think, straight down between Yuri and Vertella at, at the right where they're going at the moment. So, if you have a look just beyond the lights there, there's the Lucky Impala who spotted her. And you can see now, once she's been spotted, she gives up. Her body language changes and she's on the march. And the others should be coming up behind us. So it looks like she might. Uh, we're going to pass very close to Fireside Chat. That's Fireside Chat there. There's the lion. I just want to get up ahead uh, to have a look if there are any other animals on quarantine. We will come back to her now. And let's just have a look what's up ahead. Okay. Looks like there's nothing else on quarantine this evening. Apart from the single lucky Impala. That was so exciting. Oh, she nearly got to that impala before he spotted her. That's why a lot of the animals like to choose these open areas like this to sleep at night. It makes it that little bit harder for the lions to stalk up to them. She's walking straight past us, and there's no other animals around on quarantine, so I think we're going to give them a chance to, to hunt without us hampering them. Not that I think we were, but it'll be quite nice for them to just go off, and we'll try to follow up in the morning to see what happened, whether they caught something, whether they're successful, or whether they'll still be on the hunt on the sunrise safari. I'll just Here's the second lioness coming. Aren't they just the most incredible big cats? Oh, a bit of phlegm and grimace. She's smiling at you for the end of the show. She's saying goodbye. I'll see you all tomorrow. And so will Viam and myself and the rest of the Safari Live crew. It's been great. Lion and leopards on the Sunset Safari and a little bit of excitement of a hunt at the end. Now, those two are smelling urine and giving you their funny faces. And you're not going to see my funny face till tomorrow morning. So see you in a few short hours for the Sunrise Safari.